So now that baseball season is getting started, we are going to cover the history of baseball. And here in our starting slide, we can see some of the greatest players and managers of all time, like Willie Mays and some of the great pitchers like Walter Johnson and Bob Gibson. And if you're wondering who this guy is up here, well, that's Abner Doubleday. Now, if you've ever heard that Abner Doubleday invented baseball, you might have heard wrong there. Abner Doubleday was a Civil War general. Al Spalding was commissioned by baseball at one point to pinpoint baseball's origins. And he came up with the story that Abner Doubleday invented baseball while walking through a field in Cooperstown, New York. Um, even today, the Baseball Hall of Fame is there in Cooperstown, New York. But Abner Doubleday didn't really have much to do with it. That was more based on a rumor. It really came from a game called Rounders, which is a sport still played in England today um, by young people. And there's a similar game that came out of Rounders called Cricket, which you might have heard of. It's very popular in um, Britain and South Africa, places like that. So this game came from England to New England. It spread across the ocean, and it also spread from the colonial era to the industrial era. And as the industrial era started happening, and more and more cities in the north became bigger, baseball began to catch on in those cities. And one of those cities was the Big Apple itself, New York. And uh, one of the most influential uh, things in recording baseball was the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club. It was started in 1842, but it wasn't formally established until 1845. Now, these were amateurs. These were people who just played baseball just for fun and for exercise. The president of the organization was a doctor named Daniel Lucius Adams, known as Doc, who is still not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. If anybody from the Hall of Fame is watching this, put him in. Put him in already. Alexander Cartwright was a bank clerk professionally, was the secretary and then vice president. By the late 1850s, they joined with 16 other New York clubs to form one of the first baseball associations known as the National Association of Ball Players. And what they're mainly known for is for revolutionizing the rules by coming up with a new standard set. Hmm, I wonder what that might have uh, gone like. Maybe something like this. Well, hello, Doc. Hello, Alexander. How's it going? Well, as president of the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club, I can see some problems. Problems like what? Well, firstly, we don't have a standard set of rules to use when we play. Secondly, the games are taking too much time. Well, as a vice president of the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club, I couldn't agree more. I love to play the game. But it just goes on too long. I know, I love to play the game too. But we always play until we, one team reaches 21 runs, and that takes forever. We go through so many innings. So many innings. Wait, what if there was a set number of innings? I mean, we could just set each game to be, say, nine innings, and that's it. It's fine. Oh, and while we're setting limits, we should limit the number of players on the field at once. Teams put as many players in the field as they want, and it gets crowded out there. I think eight is enough. Eight? Well, a, a pitcher, a catcher, one for each base, and then three in the outfield, one in the left, one in the right, and one in the center. Oh, speaking of the outfield, that's another issue with the baseballs that we have. Hey, I'm the one who makes those baseballs. Have you got a problem with them? They don't travel very far. 
Oh, you're right. They don't travel very far. Whenever the outfielders throw them to the infielders, they stop short. Wait, what if we add a position between the outfield and the infield where I stand between them, catch the throw from the outfield, and throw the catch to the infield? That way, when the ball stops short, it only makes a short stop. We could even call it that. Short stop? Yes. So he catches the throw and throws the catch. Naturally. So the shortstop is there when it's south short to make sure it's only a shortstop. Exactly. Well, I like it. But what if later on we don't need a relay throw? Well, we could stick the shortstop between second and third or something. So that brings the total number of players on the field up to nine. Nine is fine. Oh, and we should stop rewarding an out for when a player catches the ball on a bounce. They should catch it in the air. It's more exciting. Oh, we could call it a fly out. Oh, also, we should probably stop rewarding an out for hitting a player with the ball. That hurts. Agreed. So, as you can see, the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club changed the rules of baseball for the better. And now we get to our first trivia question. What set of brothers organized the first professional baseball team? You can either unmute your mic or type your answer in the chat box. Does anybody seem to miss any answers? No? Well, the answer is, it was D, the Wright brothers. And these Wright brothers are Henry and George, not Orville and Wilbur. So they were from an English family. Henry was born in the United Kingdom. George was born right here in the USA. And Henry, uh, was with, on a cricket club with their father, Sam, that played at Elysian Fields where the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club played. And he eventually joined the Knickerbockers and became their first play, paid player. Both of the brothers played for the New York Gotham's in 1864, but Harry went to Cincinnati and George went to Washington, although it was originally to play cricket, not baseball. So they got back together in Cincinnati and formed the Cincinnati Red Stockings, which was the first professional baseball team. Harry was the pitcher and as well as a center fielder and a manager, and George was the shortstop. They compiled a 57 and 0 record in 1869, but did do so hot the next season. And so they had disbanded before 1871. But it was the start of professional baseball, and they would play with the Boston Red Stockings in the National Association. So what is the National Association? Well, it's a four-month runner to the National League that we have today. So the National Association was the first professional league. The Boston Red Sox stockings with the Wright brothers playing for them won every year from 1872 to 1875. So all the years except the first one. Eventually, some of the other teams didn't like that because the Chicago White Stockings owner, William Fulbert, he, uh, he took exception to this and he wanted a new league with new rules. Eight teams only. Uh, so a limit of how many teams there could be. No team jumping, so players, once they signed with one team, could go to another team at the end of the season, which was common at the time. No gambling was a big issue. And he wanted the Eastern clubs and Western clubs to be equal. Also, there was no serving beer on Sunday. So when the Cincinnati Red Stockings, the new team that did Cincinnati Red Stockings that had started, 
served beer on Sunday, they got kicked out of the National League and formed the American Association. And the games between the American Association and National League were the forerunner to the modern day World Series. Also, there was a Players League, which was exactly what it sounded like, like where the players owned the teams. So, baseball, uh, you may have heard, was segregated for a very long time. So, let's look at how that got started. In 1878, Bud Fowler was the first black professional baseball player, but he was playing in the minor leagues. In 1884, Moses Fleetwood Wallet, the receiver, was the first black player in the major leagues. Uh, he played in the American Association. Now, Cap Anson, who was the first um, baseball's first superstar, the first to reach 3,000 hits, refused to play against him. And eventually, there was an unwritten rule excluding black players starting in 1887, and it was called the Gentleman's Agreement. Now, there would eventually be leagues formed specifically for black players starting in 1920 with the National, the Negro National League founded by Ruth Foster, who would own the new, the Chicago American Giants in that league. Now, you may have heard of another league other than the National League called the American League that is still around today. So let's look at how that got started. It started out as a minor league, known as the Western League, back in 1893. It changed its name in 1899 and changed its status to a major league in 1901. In 1903, the National League finally recognized it as equal. And so they had the first World Series that year between the Pittsburgh Pirates, led by their star shortstop, Honus Wagner, and the Boston team, known as the Americans or the Pilgrims, because they didn't have the nickname the Red Sox yet. And they were led by the star pitcher, Cy Young. And Pittsburgh was expected to win. Boston pulled off the upset and showed everyone that American teams could be good too. Now, the next year, there was no World Series because the New York Giants said, we're the champions, we're not going to play any American League team, we're already the winners. But the next year after that, 1905, they changed their minds and they won the World Series. And it's been played every year since then, except 1994, when there was a labor dispute, when there was a um, Major League Baseball strike. Honest Wagner went on to win the base, the World Series in 1909, and a baseball card of him from that year is worth over a million dollars. So, time for the next trivia time. You can unmute your mics or you can type your answers in the chat box. What Hall of Fame pitcher led the Chicago Cubs to World Series titles in 1907 and 1908, in spite of the fact that he was missing at least one finger on his throwing hand. Is it A, Mordecai Brown, B, Walter Johnson, C, Bob Gibson, or D, Sandy Koufax? We'll give you a minute to answer. Are there any answers coming in? All right. So the correct answer is A, Mordecai Brown. So we're going to say a little bit about the Chalmers Award. It was when Hugh Chalmers, who owned a car company, offered a car as a reward for the player who won the batting title. But the American League title was essentially a tie in spite of the fact that Nat Lajaway uh, 
was given some easy hits by the St. Louis Rams because they didn't like the guy he was competing against, Ty Cobb, one of another one of the great baseball players of all time. Uh, so it was ruled a tie, and they both got cars. And from then on, they awarded it based on the most valuable player, which is the award we use today, the most valuable player. Now, the Black Sox scandal is something you heard about if you saw my video of the Roaring Twenties. So if you haven't, basically what it was is in the 1919 World Series, the Chicago White Sox were accused, had eight players accused of throwing the game to get money. And that caused a huge scandal which damaged baseball's reputation. But the reputation rebounded once more home runs started to be hit. So that started when um, after a game between the New York Yankees and Cleveland Indians changed baseball forever. Carl Mays threw a pitch that hit and killed shortstop Ray Chapman of the Cleveland Indians. So baseballs were redesigned. They had gotten harder since back in the days of Doc, of Doc and Alexander. But now they started to get a little bit softer again so they could travel a lot farther. More home runs were being hit, and this is known as the transition from the dead ball era to the live ball era. Now, of course, the biggest star of the live ball era was Babe Ruth. Oh, hold on just a minute. Let me grab my mask and answer the door. Hello there. Hello there. Well, if it isn't Babe Ruth himself, folks, uh, we were just talking about the live ball era and how you were one of the biggest stars. Uh, would you like to tell everyone about it? Certainly. All right. Well, hello. Uh, my name is George Herman Ruth, but most folks call me Babe. I've been called the greatest baseball player in history. So I think that if you want to learn about baseball, you should learn a little about me. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1895. As a youngster, I would often skip school and cause trouble. So I was sent to the St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys. There, one of my teachers changed my life. His name was Brother Matthias, and he loved baseball. He taught me how to play, and realized how good I was. Later, he invited Jack Dunn, the owner of a minor league team named the Baltimore Orioles, to watch me play. Dunn was impressed, and since I was not legally an adult at the time, he had to become my legal guardian for me to join the team. The other players teased me, saying I was Jack's newest babe, and the nickname stuck. The team went to Fayetteville, North Carolina for spring training that year, where I hit my very first professional home run. Pretty soon, I was playing for the Boston Red Sox in the majors. I started as a pitcher, and a pretty good one at that. I once led the league in earned run average and helped the Red Sox win three World Series. However, it was obvious I could hit home runs better than I could pitch. So I also started playing in the outfield to play in more games. Of course, a pitcher hitting home runs was a bit odd, even when splitting his time up between pitching and playing in the outfield, especially since my 29 home runs in 1919 broke the single season home run record. I expected to get a big raise for that. Instead, I got traded. It went something like this. Hello. Yes, this is Harry Frazee. Yes, the Harry Frazee owns the Red Sox. Yeah, I am still interested in investing in that new Broadway show. No, not, no, no, Nanette, the other one. Yeah, that one. Well, I've still got plenty of money, but a lot of it is tied up paying, paying players. 
You, you know, running a baseball team is expensive. Hey, boss. Let me call you back. What? How about a raise? What? I just broke a home run record. You've also showed up late to spring training. I don't care if you broke a record. We finished in sixth place last season. You know, I have half a mind to trade you to the New York Yankees. They offered me a lot of money. Hey, wait a minute. Get out of here. Hello, operator. Get me the New York Yankees. I'll back that Broadway show. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, it went a little something like that. And once I joined the New York Yankees, I went from a star to a superstar. I became a full-time outfielder and a full-time home run hitter. It started with breaking my 1919 home run record in 1920 by hitting 54 homers instead of 29. The next season, I hit 59 homers. The Yankees went to the World Series that season and the next two seasons after that, finally winning on our third try. We lost the World Series in 1926, but won the next two years in a row. Also, in 1927, I hit 60 home runs in a single season. In the 1932 World Series, I had what was probably the most famous moment in my career when with two strikes and Chicago Cubs players and fans mocking me. Well, I made a gesture towards center field and then blasted a homer into the stands. People still debate whether I call my shot or not. So I'll leave it up to you to decide. I made the All-Star team in 1933 and 1934. The first two times an All-Star team was selected. I played one last season for the Boston Braves in 1935 before retiring and being one of the first five players inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1936. And that's the story of Babe Ruth. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well, we heard Babe Ruth's story straight from him. Now let's talk about the New York Yankees as a team. Uh, so as Babe told us about, they won in 1923, 1927, 1928, and 1932 with him. After he was gone, uh, they continued on with his teammate, Luke Gehrig, and a new player called Joe DiMaggio. Uh, from 1936 to 1939, they won it every year, uh, four years straight. Unfortunately, Fortunately, Luke Gehrig got a horrible disease called ALS, and um, he died not long afterwards. Um, but they kept winning with Joe DiMaggio, and from 1949 to 1953, they won five straight in a row as they transitioned from having Joe DiMaggio as their center fielder to Mickey Mantle as their center fielder. And they have won 27 world titles as of uh, as of their full span as a franchise. So now let's talk about the impact World War II had on baseball. There were several stars who served in the military. You can see Jackie Robinson there. We're going to talk a little bit more about him later. Ted Williams was a pilot in World War II as well as Korea, and he's one of the greatest hitters of all time, but he never reached 3,000 hits, and people think he would have reached that and would have possibly broken Babe Ruth's career home run record, if not for all this time in the military. There were a lot of other hitters who might have hit 500 home runs if uh, they hadn't taken time out from military service like Stan Musel and uh, Joe DiMaggio, who we mentioned played for the Yankees a uh, minute ago. There were also pitchers who were star players that served like Warren Spahn and Bob Feller. 
and a women's professional be formed uh, during the, the World War II era. It was called the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, and it had a lot of its own stars, uh, while the male stars were more like, for example, Dottie Schroeder was one of the stars. Oh, uh, let me grab my mask and get that. Oh, hello. Well, Dottie, we were just talking about you and the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Would you like to tell everyone at home about it? I would love to. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Dorothy Schroeder. Everyone calls me Dottie. I was a baseball player in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. I was the only player who played every season the league operated from 1943 to 1954. It helped that I started so young. I was only around 15 when I began my career, but I quickly became a star. I was a favorite among fans for my fielding ability, graceful catching and scooping up balls like a human vacuum cleaner. I also had a good throwing arm, making me the best defensive player in the league. As far as hitting goes, I was okay, but not as good as some other players like Dorothy Kamenchuk. If you're wondering about the baseball league I played in, then let me explain. During World War II, with many of the best male players in the military, someone decided it was time for ladies to play. Philip K. Wrigley, who had gotten rich from his shoeing gun company, owned the Chicago Cubs. He had an idea for a girls' league. Originally, he thought softball was a better option, but it was eventually decided that it would be indeed a baseball league. It continued on after the war, and there were about a million fans by 1948. Eventually, the league folded, but not before we showed everyone that girls could play too. There's an exhibit about us in the Hall of Fame, and even a movie. That's my story. Well, thank you for coming to share your story. Anytime. All right. See you later. Well, let's talk about another group that had their own baseball league, and that is uh, the leagues for black players, known as the Negro Leagues. And these had several superstars of their own, including Satchel Paige, who was considered the greatest pitcher of those leagues and he actually went on to play after baseball was integrated um, and even though he was at an age when most players are retiring or have retired he made the all-star team and even played in the world series josh gibson was the best hitter and the best catcher in the uh, Negro Leagues, and Josh Gibson sadly died before integration happened, right before integration happened. But Leonard from here in North Carolina, he was from Rocky Mount. He was the best first baseman, and he holds the record for the most all-star appearances with 11. Who Papa Bell was a player known for his running ability, known for being the fastest. There's a legend that he once hit the ball, it went through the field, and it hit him as he was rounding the second base. Another great center fielder was Oscar Charleston, and a great third baseman was Judy Johnson. The only woman elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame is Ethel Manley who was an owner of these leagues, and they were officially made major leagues in December of 2020 as part of their 100th anniversary celebration. So let's talk a little bit about Jackie Robinson. We went over him, and we went over civil rights leaders, if you saw that video. If not, I highly recommend it. And Jackie Robinson was born in Cairo, Georgia, but his family moved to California when he was still very young, and he became a sports star at UCLA. Not only did he play baseball, but also basketball, football, and track. 
He served in the army during World War II, which I've already mentioned, and he also played in Kansas City Monarchs with the Negro Leagues. Uh, but he became the first player to break the color barrier first. And for, because of that segregation of baseball ended, first he became the first black minor league player since segregation had started with Montreal, and then the first in the major leagues with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He won the Rookie of the Year that year in 1947. He was the 1949 MVP, and he helped the Dodgers win the World Series in 1955. The year afterwards, after the 1956 season, he got traded to the New York Giants, but he chose to retire rather than to keep, keep on playing at that point. He was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962, and he's the only player to have his number retired throughout every major league team. You can see him there with his best friend on the team, he Reeves. That's him with his wife. Him with some of the other great players, Roy Campanella and Gil Hodges, shaking hands with General Douglas MacArthur and saying hello to his wife. So because integration happened, now there was a lot more talent out there, which means that Major League Baseball could expand like never before. So all these teams got added starting in the early 60s, going throughout the 70s, and then later on in the 90s. And so this meant some more changes for baseball in that they had to start dividing the leagues up into divisions and adding playoffs um, to uh, accommodate all these teams. So, time for our next trivia time, and that is which expansion team, all those teams we just listed, was the first to win the World Series? And this is a picture of their stadium right here. If you know the stadium, you can guess the team. Is it A, the Houston Astros, B, the Los Angeles Angels, C, the New York Mets, or D, the Texas Rangers. You can turn off, you can unmute your mics or you can type your answer in the chat box. Do we have any answers out there? Okay, people are being shy today, but that's okay. The answer is the New York Mets with Nolan Bryant and Tom Seabrook. So one last player we're going to talk about, we, we talked about Babe Ruth and Dottie Schroeder. Uh, and this one's not here with us today. His name is Hank Aaron. He was born in Mobile, Alabama, and he played for the Indianapolis Clowns in the Negro Leagues, making him the last player to play in both the Negro Leagues and what was then Major League Baseball. He started in Major League Baseball with the Milwaukee Braves in 1954, and he went on to be the 1957 MVP, and they won the World Series that year. The Braves moved to Atlanta in 1966, and he continued to be playing great throughout all those years, so much so that by 1974, his first home run of the season tied Babe Ruth's all-time record and his second home run broke that record. He did that while people were giving him death threats and taunting him because they didn't want to see Babe Ruth's record broken by a black man. He later played two, his last two seasons with the Milwaukee Brewers, finishing with a total of 755 home runs, and he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1982. Sadly, he just died earlier this year. So during the steroids era, a lot of home run records that were seemed unbreakable. Uh, Roger Maris had already broken Babe Ruth's single season home run record with one home run. That was broken by several and multiple times. 
And so with all that, these record, home run records being broken, you know, people were wondering, how is this happening? It turns out once baseball instituted PED testing and Jose Canseco wrote a memoir called Juice that it turns out it was due to performance enhancing drugs. And pitchers like Roger Clemens used them too. Uh, and there were several stars who used steroids throughout that era. So, so we can end on a more positive note. Let's talk about some of the other innovations that had come on through the years that are a bit a little bit better than the PED era. Free agency started. Um, it was led by Marvin Miller, who was the Major League Baseball Players Association leader from 1966 to 1982. Internationalism. Baseball started spreading not just in popularity in our country, but throughout the world, especially in the Far East. Japan and South Korea. Uh, that's Ishiro Suzuki, who played in Japan before playing in the major leagues in Latin America. Going back to the 1950s with stars like Roberto Clemente. And of course, sabermetrics have changed how we look at baseball statistically due to Bill James, who helped the Boston Red Sox reverse the curse of the Bambino and finally won a World Series after 86 years, from Beirut in 1918 all the way till 2004. Here are the citations. And go ahead and be thinking about what questions you want to ask. All right, there's Jackie Robinson sliding into home and we're sliding into home now. So thank you all for coming and let me know what questions you have. Are there any questions out there? Oh, oh and uh, also, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, remember to email me at jmentor at leecountync.gov. All right, if there's no more questions, we're ready to wrap it up now. Um, thank you all again for coming, and you have a great evening, everyone. Bye.